This is The Future Of, where experts share their vision of the future and how their work is helping shape it for the better. And welcome back into the new year. I'm Amelia Searson and today is our first episode for 2021. We've got quite the lineup of episodes planned and I'm particularly excited about today's topic. The media is a part of most of our lives, whether that be through social platforms like Facebook or more traditional forms like television, news and radio. They all play a big role in influencing our perceptions of the world and how it works. But how often do you see someone with disability in the media? One billion people in the world live with a disability, and yet they're rarely represented in the media. Or when they are, it's often through negative stereotypes or inaccurate portrayals. As someone who is wanting to become a journalist, it's important that I learn how to better represent and re-image disability in society through more accurate representations in the media. To discuss this topic with me today are Professors Katie Ellis and Mike Kent. Katie and Mike are from the Centre for Culture and Technology at Curtin University. Thanks so much for coming in today. Thanks for asking Thank you. So Katie, COVID-19, of course, has been in the media non-stop this year. You know, it still is, of course. What do you think the media coverage during this time has revealed about our current attitudes and treatment of people who have disability? It's a really great question because, you know, we're at a particular point in COVID-19 where there have been lots of changes. So we've seen a lot of different types of representation about disability with COVID-19. So at the beginning, I think people with disabilities were kind of really being used to reassure everyone else that, you know, this terrible unknown disease wouldn't really impact them. It was just people who maybe had pre-existing medical conditions. And then, you know, as we travelled a bit further down, we saw that COVID-19 really affected everyone. So, you know, the media started recognising the vulnerability of people in disabled care and aged care and things like that. Um, And then I think as we moved further down, people started empathising with the disability situation because we were seeing, you know representation on TV that didn't reflect our reality, stuck at home. You know, people in Summer Bay still out there on the beach. We couldn't do that. We're at home. So it became important for the whole population to see our reality on TV. And this is something people with disability don't get all of the time. And then all of a sudden it was all of us, you know, saying that these TV shows really aren't reflecting what I go through. It's interesting also. During COVID-19, we suddenly saw that things we've been told weren't possible for people with disabilities, suddenly everyone was doing. So, you know, from something as simple as Pokemon Go, you couldn't play Pokemon Go if you couldn't walk around in the environment collecting Pokemon. And um, the, the manufacturer said, no, that's an essential part of it until everyone was locked down. And they said, oh, actually, no, now we've changed it. You can play at home. No problem at all. Even more so, you know, people suddenly discovered that actually people can work from home if they can't commute into work every day. They can have a computer set up to be accessible for them. And suddenly everyone was doing it. Before we went on, we were talking about how headphones sold out and that sort of thing as everyone moved to a home office. People with disability for years have been told, well, no, we can't have you working from home and we can't give you a job because we can't accommodate you. So then we saw, you know, a lot of people with disabilities contributing to the media and commenting and writing blog posts and social media posts about how, you know, we've been telling you all along that we could work and study from home and now we all have to do it. Mm. I think it helped that people were really hungry for news during that time and they were looking for diverse voices and um, just going back onto your point, Mike, do you think uh, going into the future there, this has sort of spearheaded more, I guess, workplace opportunities for people with disability? I hope so. I, I really hope that. And, and I think it probably has just because I think actually the way we engage with the workplace has changed. We're not going to see the same numbers of people moving into CBDs. We can already see people are moving from, you know, city centres into regional areas in Australia on the assumption that they can now work from home. And while, uh, you know, that's its own sort of thing going on, I think as a, as a helpful side effect, people with disabilities will have more, um, more opportunities. And Mike, a lot of your research within the centre takes a social approach to disability. Can you explain what that means? Can, at length, but I'll try and keep it short. <laughs> so the, the social approach or the social model of disability is really 
it's quite revolutionary. I mean, it comes back from, although its origins are probably in the 70s, it's the idea that we, we have this sort of medical approach to disability, that someone with a disability is sick and needs curing, um, and it's sort of their problem. So it's really, uh, you're individualized. So you're a person who's a wheelchair user or someone who's blind or someone who's dyslexic. You have, um, those problems are your problems and society just has nothing to do with it. It's all your problem. The social, the social approach says actually, no, it's society's problem. The fact that I'm a wheelchair user and I'm not a wheelchair user for those who can't see me, um, means that the problem is someone decided to mean, make, make stairs going up to that door. They weren't necessary. That could have been a ramp. Um, so that, that then is, that's what disables people. It's society and the attitudes of society that, that cause the problems rather than, um, rather than it being born by the individual. And I suppose the other, uh, the other social aspect of it is trying to say that people with disabilities have common cause. So I'm a, I am a person with dyslexia, but I still support wheelchair ramps. Um, there's, there's a, there's an, uh, there's an idea that there is a, there is a, a large group of people with disabilities and they all need to advocate together to change society. From the technology perspective, it's even more interesting. It's very hard to make a beach wheelchair accessible in nature. But once we start using sort of online platforms and things like this, these are entirely made by people. So whether something's accessible or not is definitely a choice. You can't just go, oh no, that, that's just, you know, beach sand. It's just tricky. You go, well, actually, no, your website has all these little, you know, hidden buttons on it, which means a screen reader can't use it, which means someone who's blind can't access it easily. And that's a decision that's been made rather than just a, a inevitable part of sort of the natural world. Mm. It's so easy and I guess convenient for decision makers to just palm it off or put it in the too hard basket, isn't it? Mm, but, absolutely. And I think it's the persistence of the medical model that you were talking about that really creates this situation where we're in where we you know people do think about disability as a problem with someone's body so that problem should be solved within the body according to the medical model but what Mike and I are looking at is the way society creates barriers around that body that don't have to be there they are like Mike says decisions made by people and particularly when it comes to new media we don't have to make these decisions. Mm. That actually links in quite well to a perception that I hear quite a lot, which is uh, people with disability are either, in inverted, commas, in inverted commas, charity cases or heroes. There can't be anything else, you know. I, I hear that quite a lot. Um, what are your thoughts on, on that? Yeah, and I think, you know, the media really p plays into that, that they're the two representations we get of people with disabilities, either they're a, cha a charity that, you know, we can give to to make us feel better about ourselves uh, or um, they're an inspiration. So Stella Young talked about inspiration porn in a TEDx, you know, that's widely available online. And, you know, she, she was really trying to draw attention to the fact that people with disabilities are treated as inspirational just for living their lives and doing ordinary things that people without disability wouldn't be celebrated in the same way. And she said in her TEDx talk that the media just can't get past that. They can't get past the idea that people with disabilities are an inspiration. Mm. For anyone interested in listening to that TEDx talk, we can link that in our show notes. So, Katie, what are some of the more traditional stereotypes the media uses when they're representing people with disability? And what impact do you think these stereotypes can have on the community? Okay, so I think the, the traditional stereotypes that we see are the ones we're talking about, you know, tragedy, inspiration. Another one is disability being a punishment for evil. You know, we see that a lot, you know, in soap operas and crime dramas and things like that, that people with disabilities are punished in a particular way for, for doing something wrong. Um, in the crime drama, we also see there's a stereotype that's been called the defective detective. So that's the idea that, you know, a detective might have some kind of disability or mental health condition that gives them a greater insight and greater ability to solve a crime or makes them a bit quirky and more interesting to watch on TV. So, you know, you could argue that's a negative stereotype or that's a positive stereotype, but it's it's definitely a characterization that, you know, has emerged 
particularly when crime drama was really popular, which is not so much now. <laughs> Maybe if we look at reality TV, we do see the inspirational model coming up a lot or, you know, this is something for us to feel sorry for. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have any, Do you have any thoughts on that, Mike? Oh, of course. Um, yeah, the, the, the villain who's evil because they have a disability and they never got over it is, I mean, that's even an earlier version of the, the disability as punishment. And I think it, it's also important to, to, we often frame this from an entirely Western perspective. And, you know, I'm working with a group of scholars in Africa at the moment. Some of the perceptions around disability as, you know, a punishment from God effectively to a family or to an individual is very, that's a, again, one of those sort of recurring themes, which is obviously, you know, particularly harmful for people with disabilities. When I was doing my PhD, I, I was reading a lot of work from disability scholars about how in the Bible that disability is often used as a punishment for wrongdoing. But there, there are also instances in the Bible where disability is pointed out as a social thing, you know, like make the straight, the path straight so that people can walk on them. So, uh, you know, I think we really need to be careful about saying, you know, it's a wholly negative or wholly positive. You like know, the when Bible we take old school media. Yeah, cool. the Bible is old school media. <laughs> old school for me, it's not, it doesn't figure into my research at all these days. So I don't know why I brought it up. <laughs> hmm. But I think it goes to even in the same, you know, media text, we can have progressive and, and older style representations. And I think for me now and for my work now, what I really like is the conversations that arise around particular representations. So when people do watch a movie or they do watch a TV show, then they go on Facebook, or Twitter and talk about it. And, you know, in that way, we can come to understand experiences of disabilities and different people's points of view about whether this is, you know, a positive or a negative, realistic or unrealistic. And taking, you know, a right angle to your question, it also leads to questions about representation of actors with disability. Mm. So, what, you know, the people who are actors and do have a disability, um, her name starts with M and she's a deaf actress. Very no, famous. No. Yes, is a great, thank you. <laughs> is, a, is a good example of an actress who is a person with a disability and that sort of gets, that is accommodated in the roles she often plays. Whereas if you have someone like, you know, Dustin Hoffman in Rain Man, you know, they could have actually got a person who was on the spectrum to have played, to have played a role rather than him being a great actor for pretending to be someone that lots of people are. Yeah, and that's something we see a lot, people getting nominated for Academy Awards for portraying a person with a disability rather than that role having actually gone to a person with a disability. Mm. And how do you think that makes people with disability feel? Do you think generally people would prefer to have someone with a disability representing them or do you think it's, I guess, just good to have the disability representation in the movies or the TV shows? Oh, diving into interesting this, grey areas. Yeah. <laughs> Look, I, without wanting to speak for anyone else with a disability, but my point of view is that we should we should be more supportive of actors with disabilities and, and ensuring they get these roles because right now they're not. And, you know, often the argument seems to be is, oh, we need to have, there needed to be a scene where that person was dreaming they weren't disabled or we need the mm. time in their life prior to when they acquired a disability, so we needed an able-bodied person to portray the role. Mm. But why do we need these dream sequences, right? <laughs> I remember, was it Artie in Glee? Yes, I was you just know, thinking was, that. Yeah. Mm. That was, you know, there was a lot of controversy around him. Just, that could have been portrayed by a person in a wheelchair. Yeah. I remember being at a seminar, we're watching all these sort of portrayals of disability on film. And there were, there were sort of some questions. I think it was an actor in New Zealand of small stature who was, you know, doing the, being played in a very typical role for laughs of someone like that. And there was a bit of discussion. And then one of the, one of the people with disability who's an actor in the audience was like, well, he's got a job. That's great. Yeah. So there's, there's different ways of approaching it. Yeah, it's a very interesting topic, that's for sure. And Mike, what are some progressive representations of people with disability in the media that you've seen? Mm, see, I was interesting because when I, I, I knew that you were going to ask that question, um, 
I think uh, Dylan Olcott is a is a in, 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 who's a, um, an ANZ sort of face um, is fantastic. Just because the fact that he is a a man who's a wheelchair user, even famous for being a wheelchair user, that's not what they play on in the ads. They just go, "Here's a famous athlete using his you know Apple Watch to pay for his meal because he's left it behind you." Just scenarios that don't really focus on um, on the fact that he's a wheelchair user or a person with disability. And those those sort of, um, almost, I'm not sure if I'm using the right language, but normalized portrayal. You know, here is a person that we are using to advertise. We're using them because they're a famous person. They also happen to be a, f a person with disability. Or they're not a famous person. They just happen to be a person with disability. But people with disability exist in the world and we're just going, you know, so we're using them as part of our, our representation, I think, is is something that's becoming more and more common, which I think is really great to see. And I think we see that more in advertising than any other form of yeah. media. It seems to be we can have these moments where we have scenes of people with disabilities who are who are part of the consumer group, I guess. Why do you think that might be, that we see more representation in ads than in movies? Or I think it's partly because ads are less problematic mm. and trying to reach a wider audience. So I think advertising goes, we're going to try and make the world the way people see the world, which isn't necessarily the same good-looking, white, American-accented actors, you know, to, use, to take the stereotype to its full extent. Um, but, you know, people with disabilities exist in the world. We're trying to sell our products, so we're representing the world back at them. Um, and perhaps there's less opportunity for disturbing narratives around that as well. Although there are some terrible inspiration porn ads as well. <laughs> and Katie, your advocacy has led to the increasing adoption of audio description on Australian screens. Can you tell me what audio description is and the recent progress that's happening in this area? Okay, so audio description is, I guess, exactly what it sounds like. It's, <laughs> it's an audio description. It's it's a track of, of narration describing in audio what you see on the screen of a TV show, movie, or even a live performance. It can describe, you know, characters' costumes, facial expressions, you know, the weather, what's happening, what other things happening in the scene at the same time. And it makes it makes visual media accessible to people who are blind or have low vision, so people who can't see the screen. Yeah, and so the um the advocacy that Mike has also been involved in, in audio description has, has actually led to the introduction of audio description on the Australian Public Broadcasters this year from, I think it was July, um, so the ABC and the SBS. And they've introduced about 14 hours a week. And this audio description is something that the um, vision impaired community have been advocating for in Australia for about 30 years. So, you know, if we can think of a good thing that's happened in 2020, this, this is my good thing. Mm, yeah, absolutely. And, and it, uh, it, it really is catch up. We're the last um, English-speaking developed country to not have, or we were, to not have audio description available on TV. Yeah. yeah um, you know, and well before this, Netflix had audio description on all of its shows, including in multiple languages. Um, so we're... Yes, this is the best thing in 2020, but it's also the saddest thing in 2020 because, you know, yes, it's sad that we're telling you what audio description is. <laughs> it's like people always go, oh, like captions. You go, well, yes, and also entirely not at all like captions, yes. the reverse almost. Mike, your research revolves a lot around digital technology. Mm -hmm. Can you explain some of the ways that digital technology is both creating and alleviating disability? Well, it sort of gets back to the point I was making earlier about when we, the digital technology and the, the media that it produces is entirely made by people. So it's particularly frustrating when people make decisions to make it inaccessible to some group of people. And even more so, I'm going to go on a bit of a rant now, so, so I apologise. Digital technology is, it, it can be converted to so many different things. So if I've got a page of information, say it's a page of text, I can read it on a screen. That screen can be enlarged. The background can be changed. 
I can have it read to me by a machine, I can feel it on a braille tablet. So all these different options to be accessible to the widest audience. And similarly, you know, the you can put that information in using a braille typewriter or I can use spoken word or I can use a traditional keyboard or eye tracking um, software. So at its most base level, digital technology is incredibly accessible both to consume and produce. So as soon as we then take the next step, inevitably we stop making it as accessible. So we decide, are we going to frame the text in a, a particular way or we're going to, rather than have it as information, we're going to have it as a picture. Um, so that we can't, it's harder to recognize for machines to then translate it to braille or speech or that sort of thing. So it's a double, it, it's, it's not really a two-edged sword. It should be really straightforward and simple, but it, it is very frustrating someone coming from the social model to see when things which should be so fantastically accessible are then made harder and harder to access generally for, you know, aesthetics or worse to comply with um with accessibility laws so you some of your listeners might remember when every web page had that stupid shadow behind every image so it looked like it was 3d so you'd have a little picture and then there'd be a little shadow behind it i'm using my fingers for people who can't see me i'm sorry um and the then when we had alternative text which is the text we screen readers use to describe things in order to be thorough they would say and here is a picture of Mike wiggling his finger. And then here is a shadow of the picture of Mike wiggling his finger. And it just made the whole thing completely inaccessible in order to comply with accessibility laws. So we sort of get this added layer of frustration there. And if I can bring it back to COVID again. Please. <laughs> you know, I think we all experienced during COVID that we all needed to access information in different ways. And, you know, when other things were going on, we weren't necessarily taking in all the information that we needed to at a time when we really needed to be completely up on all the information that was giving up, given to us. And what we, you know, what we did find during COVID were things like infographics, you know, and simple English and, and plain language descriptions were the way we could really understand our situations. And, and these are disability accessibility features as well. You know, so mm. it's a, again, it's a shame that things became more popularised when everyone needed it, not when people with disabilities said we need this all along. But there's another example of of how making the world accessible according to the social model really does help us all. Can I jump in there to say how frustrating it is that it came from a position where people went, no, that's impossible, we can't do that because it's too complicated, to, oh, in fact, we can do it. And in fact, one of our technicians did it from his kitchen because he couldn't come into the office. So really, it wasn't that hard. <laughs> Something that was really interesting was um, at the time of, of, the, of the quarantine in, in Perth, um, Mike and I were analysing the results of some research we did into captions, which is an, a disability media accessibility feature for people who you know, have hearing impairments or who are deaf. Um, we, we made captions available on 22 units in our school to anyone in the in the unit and said, you know, have a go, tell us what you think about these captions as a learning tool. And, you know, overwhelmingly the feedback was that people were using it while they were studying at home, you know, trying to stay focused when there are all sorts of domestic distractions going on. And this is a project we did prior to COVID but we were analysing the results during COVID. So that was, that was really interesting for us to see that, you know, some disability accessibility features could be potentially so useful. Yep, and that's an ongoing, you know, as, as, we, as, as I think all the universities, particularly here in Western Australia, are now looking going, well, what if we get a second wave and we can't have lectures in 2021? maybe we'll see that same thing where suddenly these accessibility features just which were impossible before suddenly pop up i hope so <laughs> it'll be a nice uh, you know and if not you know make it accessible for the students with disabilities yeah yeah and mentioning 2021 that leads well into my next question that i have for both of you uh looking into the future what do you hope society will be like for people with a disability 
Katie, would you like to start? I will start. <laughs> um, I hope this society will be more inclusive and, you know, we don't we won't need a pandemic to make Pokemon Go accessible to people with disabilities who'd like to play Pokemon Go from home. I hope, you know, the attitudes about disability change and I hope that the media plays a role in that by showing us, you know, some stories, some more Tyrion Lannisters who we didn't get to talk about in the podcast, you know, some really important characters who have disabilities in TV shows. And I hope people with disabilities also lead new media representations of disability from their perspective in the way they would like to. I I think... Um, people working in sort of the disability and accessibility field like us are a bit like dentists. Dentists would really like to be unemployed because no one needs dentists anymore. And I think we're very much the same. You know, from that social model of disability, society's creating the problem. If society stopped creating the problem, well, there'd be nothing for us to critique. We'd just go, oh, you know, that person's a wheelchair user, but they're not disabled by being a wheelchair user. Because we've already, you know, we've accommodated them with wheelchair ramps, just to go back to my original example. So there are, there are some aspects of disability that the social model doesn't entail. So some people live with chronic pain and, uh, you know, things like this, which are, which are beyond the scope of when we're talking the, about the sort of social nature of disability. But within the social nature of disability, I would love to see the problem solved. The, that, that these that we don't talk about it anymore because we're you know, post disability or something like that. I'm disappointed to say I don't think that's going to happen in my lifetime. So I'll probably keep working in this area for a while longer. But that if you know that's the future that I would like to see, and certainly I think it might not be completely obtainable, but it's largely obtainable. Definitely agree with you there, Mike. As someone who is wanting to become a journalist, I hope that I can be a part of that movement and hopefully see continue to see change within this area. Well, that's all we have time for today. But before we go, if our listeners want to find out more about you and your research, where should they find you? Well, we're at the Centre of Culture and Technology at Curtin University, and I'm sure you'll be able to post a link to um, our, our work and the rest of our team are accessible through that. Of course. And for anyone listening who would like to access this podcast, we do have a transcript available as well. Thank you, Katie and Mike, for sharing your knowledge on this topic with me today. Thanks very much. I'm very glad to hear you have a transcript. Yes. Yes. (laughs) Very accessible. You've been listening to The Future Of, a podcast powered by Curtin University. If you would like to share your thoughts on disability and the media or have any questions, please send us an email at thefutureof at curtin.edu.au. And if you liked what you've heard or read, please subscribe to our podcast and share this episode with your friends and family. Bye for now.